So welcome to all of our learners in the United States and Brazil and all over the world. This is an international presentation from Ascend Education. My name is Professor Robert McMillan. I am a college professor in the Portland, Oregon area, and uh, I provide all different types of training in the area of Windows servers, security, networking, and help desk, and many other types of things. And I'm very excited to be here today. We're going to be having a lot of fun today. We're going to be doing several fun exercises to help prepare you for the world of security. And I'm going to also go into various different types of certifications. Uh, we're mostly going to be talking about CompTIA certifications today. And uh, Ascend Education has a lot of great courses for many of these CompTIA certifications. I have some CompTIA certifications myself, and they're great entry level certifications, especially when you want to get started into security. This is a very exciting time to be entering the IT security field. It's one of the most underserved areas of all of information technology. And so you can see that there's a lot of great money to be made and there's very little unemployment. So most people who get into IT security are working in IT security. And here you can see some of the salaries, the average salary in the US with this security plus certificate or certification. Uh, we can use either one of those terms is $71,000. Top salary is $115,000. And when 100 different IT managers were interviewed, they said, how much more money would a, an employee make if they had the Security Plus certification? And the average was 16%, 16% more than if you did not have that certification. And if you have even more CompTIA certifications, you can expect to earn an additional 5% for every certification that you have. So that is a very exciting thing for people who are, are looking to break into IT security. And as I mentioned earlier, it's a very exciting time. I remember when I first got into information technology many years ago, there were very few certifications. As a matter of fact, CompTIA only had the A-plus certification at that time. They didn't have anything else. And over time, they have added a lot of great certifications that have added a, a lot of great value to the people who earn them and to the companies where they work. Uh, also, when I got started, there were no college degrees for uh, IT, for information technology and operations, that computer information systems. All there were were for programming, but there was this emerging technology of networking and then came all the viruses and all the malware and that kind of thing that came along with connected computers. And then that created this whole new industry called IT security. So let's talk about breaking into IT security so you can learn what you need to do to become an IT security professional and uh, the different certifications and education that goes along with it. So the Security Plus certification, that's the first one I wanna talk about. And that's because it's a great entry level certification. So if you look into all the different types of security certifications that are out there, and there's a lot of them, a lot of great companies. One would be the EC Council, which talks about ethical hacking. Another would be the ISC Squared organization, uh, which uh, uh, prepares people to be IT security professionals as well. Those are higher end certifications and those are great certifications that you can go for a little bit later on as you get more comfortable in becoming an IT security professional. Now, you may ask yourself the same question that I asked myself many years ago. Am I good enough? Am I smart enough? Should I be, you know, can I be able to, to do this type of job? And I can say with resounding, yes, you can do this job. Fear not, you can do this job. You just need the right tools, the right training and the right opportunities. So starting off with all these different types of certifications, we're gonna talk about Security Plus. And here are the four main areas that CompTIA, which provides this certification, talks about. 
And you'll learn all about these uh, in the Ascend Education course on Security Plus. So the first thing is the assessing, assessing the security of an organization and recommend and implement appropriate solutions. I've done this many times in my career. Now, I started out as an employee. So I started as an employee of a company working in IT. And then I, I actually went to a couple of different companies over the years before I started my own company. When I started my own company, I became an IT consultant and eventually a security consultant. And now security consultants are expected to do more. They're expected to know more than the companies where they go to work. So I would always have to be on the cutting edge of, of IT security and all the different areas that I was going in to consult about. So one of those things I would do is I would walk into an organization and I would get paid to assess their security. I would look around, I would look at physical security. I would then test their security from the inside. I would test their security from the outside. And then I would make recommendations on what things needed to be done to make them secure. And that's one of the very first things that you're going to learn in the Security Plus certification. Then there's monitor and secure hybrid environments. A lot of people don't know what a hybrid environment is. So uh, many companies are now moving partially to the cloud. The cloud would be, say, Microsoft Azure, Amazon Web Services, and there's dozens of other cloud provider providing companies where you can have them host websites and email and servers and data and things like that. And so uh, if you're going to have those resources in the cloud, a lot of times people still have resources on premises. That makes your environment a hybrid environment. You exist in both places uh, where your, your resources are located. So along with that type of environment, you have multiple different devices that access those different resources, such as a Windows desktop, maybe a tablet, maybe an Apple iPad, uh, a, a mobile phone, maybe an Android or an iPhone. So you need to access your resources. Let's say you have your staff, your clients, they're out at customers trying to sell your product. They need to be able to access the data that you have saved either in the cloud or on your on-premises network. So that's a big part of learning about Security Plus. Then operating with an awareness of applicable laws and policies. We have local laws and policies that say, hey, if you lose any customer data, you have to inform that customer. That is a great ethical practice. It's a little bit scary because, you know, you don't want to lose customer data and then possibly lose your business because you've lost their data. But you should do this because it is ethical. It's the right thing to do. And there's a lot of laws that say you have to do it. So that's something that you'll learn in the Security Plus certification as well. Identify, analyze, and respond to security events, events and incidents. This is gonna to have to do a lot with looking at log files and interpreting the log file data. Artificial intelligence is great, but nothing replaces someone going in and actually looking at log files and interpreting what it is that they're seeing. So that is the Security Plus. There's another certification from CompTIA, which is very good. Now, even though it says it's the Server Plus, it's still going to have security in them. What you're going to find is a lot of these different certifications are going to overlap a little bit. So in the Security Plus, you're going to learn a little bit about servers. In Server Plus, you're going to learn about security as well. And it's really hard to understand security if you don't understand the servers that you're connecting to. So in Server Plus, you're going to learn how to install, configure, and manage server hardware and server operating systems. Now, there was a time when we would install almost exclusively on physical machines, right? Physical servers we would buy from Dell and from IBM and from HP and, and other companies. But nowadays, things are different. I remember walking into a client one time and they had four racks of servers. And these servers were getting older. You know, they were getting too old to support. Uh, the hardware manufacturer, I believe, was HP. And HP was saying, you know what? We're not going to make any more updates for this hardware. We're not going to support it if it goes down. So the client came to me and said, hey, what do I do? How, how do I uh, deal with this fact? And, and we can't afford to replace four racks of servers with four new racks of servers. So I said, no problem. I said, I can take 
all of these servers and I can virtualize them into one server. And that completely blew their minds. They're like, what? You can't do that. I said, yes, I can. I'll just get one larger server. And it, you know, it, it, it cost about the same as maybe two smaller servers, but it was still way less than four racks of servers that had maybe 30 different physical servers. And I converted all of their physical operating systems into virtual ones. And then we bought a second server to replicate the data in what's called a cluster. So the data was uh, you know, back and forth being being able to be accessed, even if one server went down, one physical server went down, that was okay. The other server made it so you could continue accessing the data. And those are the kinds of things you're going to learn in Server Plus. Implementing proper server hardening. Here's that overlap with security. You're going to be uh, implementing how to make sure that your server is going to keep from getting hacked. And one of the worst types of hacks is ransomware. Ransomware happens when someone finds a backdoor into your organization and then they encrypt your data and hold it for ransom. Now, in some cases, they're not even encrypting the data. What they're doing is they're saying, we have copied all your data to our servers, and we're going to release that data to the public. So everyone knows all of your company's secrets. That's another thing that's, that's now happening as well. So server hardening is a way that we can keep those kinds of things from happening. We can set up security controls to only allow traffic that we want to allow and to keep out hackers. Then we want to successfully troubleshoot common server problems. Server problems come up all the time. Some of them are related to security issues, and some of them are related to hardware or software problems. You need to determine what's causing those problems, how they're going to impact the organization where you work, and how to resolve them. Sometimes it means having additional parts on hand. Uh, or additional servers ready to go, or maybe even have a separate location where you can move that data in case you have, say, an earthquake or a fire or flood or something like that. These are all things that are parts of skills that you need to learn to break into IT security. And then you want to demonstrate an understanding of key disaster recovery, high availability, and backup concepts. These are also very important to security because if your data is deleted by a hacker or encrypted by a hacker, you need to be able to restore that as soon as possible. I've had several customers over the years who did not take all of my recommendations for security and they got hacked. And so uh, they said, they called me up and said, hey, what do we do? We got hacked. It's okay, I've got backups. I've got these backups in a place where they cannot be encrypted and I was able to restore their data back to the way it was within a few hours. Then usually after that, they, they tend to listen and say, oh, you know, maybe we should <laughs> take more of your advice to keep that kind of thing from happening again in the future. Here's another great uh, certification called CISA, Cyber Security Associate. And this is going to be uh, going along with the Security Plus. So the first security type of certification you want to get would be Security Plus. This is a great follow-up to Security Plus, is CISA, the Cybersecurity Associate Certification. So the first thing here you see is to leverage intelligence and threat detection techniques. Once again, these come from CompTIA. These are the things you're going to learn when you take the certification course uh, at such as at Ascend Education. And you're going to learn to leverage intelligence and threat detection techniques. That means utilizing things such as intrusion prevention and intrusion detection types of software and devices. So they're going to let you know when something out of the ordinary is happening, and they're going to notify you by email, maybe by text, maybe by phone, and then you're going to go in and find out what that threat means, whether it's a false positive or an actual threat, and then you're going to take action to protect the organization. You're going to analyze and interpret data. Now, th this is something that I, you know, I want to explain in a way uh, that relates to, say, the IT job. So if we move away from security for a second, we move to just plain old IT operations where you're just managing servers and things and managing users and things like that. The first job you get in an IT type of a job is going to be help desk. Help desk is where you take phone calls, you manage issues, uh, and then you resolve them and then you close the ticket. Well, it's a, there's a similar thing 
when it comes to IT security, and that is analyzing and interpreting data. I had a student once who, after uh, he took our security class, he emailed me and he said, hey, great news. After taking your class, I got a job, an entry-level IT security job. And I said, hey, that's fantastic. And uh, so then he got back to me about a month later and he said, I hate this job. <laughs> And I say, you hate this job. You've only been there for a month. What is it that you don't like about this job? And he said, all I do all day long is analyze and interpret data. So he's looking at log files and deciding what's important and what's not important. And I said to him, hang in there. This is how they test you to make sure that you are right for this job. If you stay there a few months, what's going to happen is you're going to get promoted to the next position. And then the next person who comes in, they're going to be analyzing and interpreting logs. It's just temporary. It's like help desk when you first get into an IT job. So he said, okay, I'll stick around in it. I, I'll, I'll, I'll stick it out. I'll do it. Okay, great. So he got back to me a few months later and he said, great news, I got promoted. I'm making more money than I ever expected to make. This The job is far more exciting now that I'm not looking at log files all day. Uh, and he continued to email me over the last couple of years to, to tell me of his progress. And I love it when students get back to me and tell me of you know how they're doing. And He's now the head of the IT security you know, department and, and he's uh, extremely happy. And now he's hiring other uh, IT security people and he's hiring some of my other students. Um, so uh, this, this is a great type of success story. But sometimes you have to put your time in at the lower levels. You're not going to walk in to a job that pays $150,000 with no experience. That's not the way things work. You're going to come into a job. You're going to make a good salary and you're going to work your way up. The good news about being in information technology and IT security is you tend to move up very quickly. There's very little unemployment and the opportunities to continue on to other job positions uh, are really great compared to other industries. So you're going to suggest preventative measures. And again, that's what I did as a consultant. But also, if you work in IT security as an employee, this, these are things you're going to be constantly doing because you're going to be looking at news articles. You're going to be reading books. You're going to be watching videos. And they're going to be saying, hey, you should start looking at possibly, uh, you know, looking at this preventative measure. You're going to take that kind of information. You're going to go to your boss and you're going to say, hey, we should start doing this to help protect our network. And those types of preventative measures are also covered in the size of certification. And of course, you want to effectively respond to and recover from incidents. And coming up here, stay tuned in just a little bit, we're going to do an exercise that shows you how to effectively respond from a malware incident. So that should be fun. And here we are. So, uh, here is a, an incident response. And I do this with my students and they really enjoy doing this. They learn a lot from it. And I think that you're going to enjoy this too. So here's what I suggest before we get started is either pull up a, a notepad or Microsoft Word or some other text editor or a pen or pencil and paper and get ready to write. Uh, just You're just gonna be writing down uh, the numbers uh, of what you're gonna be doing in what order. So here is the scenario. You are now working in IT security. And a lot of larger organizations have what's called an incident response team. It's sort of like a, a way to quickly respond to any type of threat that happens in the organization. All right, so here's what happens. An unknown virus has broken out. And this, these kinds of things have happened to me many times. So this is why I can speak from experience on this. There is talk that data files are being deleted by the thousands off computers and servers. What would you do and in what order? Also, what would you not do? What's, what's something that's not a good idea to do? So get ready to write down your answers. Here we go. Now, these are the different things that you're going to do, including one thing you're not going to do, but these may or may not be out of order. Steps one through eight. So we'll start with the first one. Inform everyone in the company of the outbreak and severity. Shut down all the PCs and servers. Let the staff continue to work. 
discuss the situation with your boss and department heads. Department heads would be like the head of the HR department, head of the accounting department. They're not necessarily your boss, but they are bosses of other, other areas in the organization. Number five, unplug the network switches for the company. Six, apply new antivirus patch to each computer. Seven, use an isolated PC to send a sample file to the AV company or anti-malware company, whatever you want to call it. So if you see a brand new virus where there's no antivirus signature, then that means that you have to call the antivirus company that you're working with and send them a sample file so they can send you the antivirus signature to install in your anti-malware program to kill that virus. And I've had to do this on several occasions. And then number eight, document the incident and the resolution. All right, I hope you have been writing down all the different uh, you know, things that you wanna do here in what order and the one thing you don't want to do because I'm about to show you what the correct order is. So here we go. All right, here is the correct order based on my experience and many years of teaching. This is what I would do, and here's why. So the first thing I would do, which was actually number four in the previous slide, the first thing I would do is I would discuss the situation with your boss and department heads. Why isn't the first thing you would do it unplug the network switches for the entire company. Why isn't that the first thing? Well, because you're not the boss of that company. You don't own that company. You can't go around unplugging people's computers in the middle of their work. You need to discuss the situation with your boss and department heads to let them know the severity of this outbreak and what could happen if we don't act quickly. After that, the, the boss and the department heads say, hey, you know what? I'm going to take your advice. We're going to go on to number two, which is inform everyone in the company of the outbreak and the severity. So there may be, they may use a, an overhead speaker. They may walk around to everybody's desk. I mean, there could be a lot of different ways that, that uh, people are informed of the outbreak and severity. That's not necessarily your problem. That's the company's decision on how they want to inform everyone. Once uh, people start getting informed of what's happening, now it's your turn. Now, you, number three is you're going to go around and unplug the network switches for the entire company. Unplugging the network switches is something that's really quick and easy to do. You can walk up to your network switch and quickly disconnect 24, 48, 96, you know, however many ports there are on all of your switches within a less than a minute. So it's even faster than shutting down the computers and it keeps the the uh, the malware from spreading from one computer to another. So if that computer is already infected, then there's not a lot you can do right that second. I mean, there's something you can do coming up, but not anything right that second. So the fastest thing to keep other people from getting infected is to unplug all the network switches. Then we have number four, shut down all the PCs and servers. All right. So everybody's disconnected from everybody else shut down all those PCs and servers. Number five, now we need to get the antivirus or anti-malware company involved. You get them on the phone, you tell them of the problem, and then they will work with you, just as they have worked with me in times past, to locate where the virus is on the computer. So you'll call them from an infected computer that's disconnected from the network, and then the two of you will, will talk over what could be causing this particular virus. Once you discover the virus, where it's coming from, what it is, uh, then, and it usually doesn't take them very long. They're, they're pretty good at this. This is what they do all the time then you're going to send a sample file to them. So you'll probably plug in, say, an external USB file, something like that, uh, or maybe even temporarily reconnect this particular computer to the internet and just have that the only one be connected, and then send them off a file. And then after that, they're going to send you back an antivirus signature file. You'll apply that patch to the computer, and then you're going to document the incident and the resolution because the next time it happens, you're going to want to make sure the next team, in case you've moved on to other companies, are ready to resolve. And number eight, something you should not do, do not let the staff continue to work until the issue is resolved because by that point, all their data may be deleted or encrypted. So I hope you did well in that, but if you, even if you didn't, that's okay. You're in the learning stage of how to break into IT security. And this is one of many different types of incidents that could happen in your organization.
We've got another one of these types of things coming up. Stay tuned. Let's talk about Cloud Plus. Cloud Plus has, again, four main areas that come from CompTIA. And the first one is going to be to manage and maintain servers. So this is not necessarily on-premises servers. These are the cloud servers, right? So you're going to manage and maintain those cloud servers uh, to make sure that they are available, they're running, they're safe and secure. You're going to analyze the workload system requirements. You want to make sure that these servers that you're renting in the cloud are not overloaded. Uh, so that you have to have enough RAM, enough processing, enough hard drive space. And the good news is you can always increase those on virtual machines whenever you need to. So if you do have a server that's overloaded, you don't have to start up a new one all the time. Sometimes all you need to do is to just increase the resources. That's much easier to do than on a physical server. Troubleshoot capacity, connectivity, and security issues. Here we go again, overlapping cert uh, certificate types of things. Security issues come up in cloud servers as well. So you want to make sure your cloud servers don't get uh, overrun in case there's a security issue that allows a hacker in. Maintain and optimize cloud environments. So you're going to want to be monitoring these particular cloud environments. Like I said, it could be virtual machines. It could be storage. It could be a lot of different things. If you open up AWS, Amazon, or Microsoft Azure, there's hundreds of different cloud services. And you'll need, to, whichever ones your company is using, you'll need to make sure that those are maintained, optimized, and secure. And you'll need to analyze cloud models to find the best fit. One of the problems, one of the big problems with cloud services is that you could end up paying too much because you haven't picked the best fit. Maybe you picked a server that was overpowered to be just a web server. Uh, so you end up paying $1,000 a month for something that should only cost maybe a hundred. You know, So you need to make sure that you understand cloud models and how to take an application and move it to the cloud so you know that it's the best fit for your organization to keep those costs down. So that's the Cloud Plus certification. Let's go on to the Pen Test. Pen Test Plus. Uh, this is another type of security certification that um, after you take the Security Plus, you can take the Pen Test Plus. This does penetration testing from the outside of the network to the inside of the network. So typically it's going to be from the outside in. Mostly it has to do with something called PCI compliance, something you might have heard of. Um, so it, PCI compliance has to do with credit cards. So in the United States, if you collect credit card information and you store it, which not everybody does, some people let the website store that stuff for them. But if you do collect credit card information, you store it on your servers, then you have to be what's called PCI compliant. And the way to become compliant is to have someone do penetration testing. So penetration testing is where uh, somebody like yourself, an IT security professional, will use various different programs to try to hack in using ethical hacking or white hat hacking into the client. And if they get in using any particular ports or any vulnerabilities that they find, they don't do any damage. They just create a report. And then they, they give that report to the client. And then the client has a certain amount of time to fix those security problems. If they don't fix them within a certain amount of time, then the credit card companies will no longer allow them to use their credit cards. That's a really big deal because sometimes many companies are 100% uh, collecting credit cards for, for payment. Uh, many organizations don't even accept cash anymore because they're all remote. Uh, so there's no way to pay them using cash. So it's very important to many companies, most companies, that they are PCI compliant if they accept and store credit card information. So you'll have to do things such as vulnerability scanning and analysis. That's those tools that I was mentioning, er, mentioning earlier. And then you have to understand governance, risk, and compliance. Not every state and not every country has the same risk and compliance rules. So if you are scanning something in, in Brazil, it might be there might be different rules, say, in the United States. So you have to understand the location and the type of business that you're scanning and what the compliance rules are. Not only is it geographic when it comes to rules compliance, but it's also the type 
of organization. If it's a healthcare, then you have to uh, be in compliance with HIPAA, HIPAA rules in the United States. If it's finance, you have to be uh, Sarbanes-Oxley compliant. These are various different laws that uh, were created by the government. So you have to understand the types of organizations as well. Researching all types of, uh, you know, researching attacks of, of all types for risk assessment. So basically knowing vulnerabilities. And then you have to report on those particular uh, issues. So you have to have good communication skills. And you'll learn all those things in the Pentest Plus course. Security related job titles. There's lots of different job titles out there, lots of different jobs, and they're constantly being updated. And one of those jobs is going to be security analyst. That's going to be one of the entry level jobs that you can get. Now, security analyst means different things to different organizations. In some organizations, you're going to be looking at log files a lot. In others, you might be doing higher end types of, of skills. Uh, but for the most part, security analyst is a starting position in IT security. Security operations center analyst has to do with, say, a data center. So if you're if you're working in a data center, you'll need to make sure all the servers in that data center are safe. I remember uh, many years ago, uh, Microsoft X, Microsoft uh, Xbox. Of course, they make the the games. Microsoft contacted uh, a contractor and said, "Hey, we need to relocate Xbox to a data center. We have them in our MSN headquarters, but we're outgrowing this. Xbox is becoming bigger and bigger. Would you?" Uh, you know, be able to move this. And this, con this contractor said, I can't, but I know somebody who can. So they called my company at the time and they said, hey, would you help us you know, relocate this? And that's exactly what we did. I relocated along with my team, uh, all of the Xbox servers from Microsoft's headquarters in Seattle to an undisclosed data center. I can't even tell you where it is because it would be a security threat to tell you where, where it's located. Now, of course, since that time, they've added additional data centers as well. But understanding the security for that kind of thing is super important. Uh, then you have incident response analyst, vulnerability management analyst. These are analysts that are the next level above the security analysts that have additional jobs and they also get additional salaries. Security engineer, that's one of the higher end types of positions. Security engineer is going to be, uh, you know, someone who manages a team of people typically to do various different types of things. And then you also have the threat hunter. They go out uh, and they look for threats within the organization. Threat hunter is kind of a fun type of a job. It doesn't necessarily pay the most. It's still very well paid, but it's not as good as say a security engineer. But it's also a fun job all day looking for threats and, and trying to figure out, you know, what kind of problems you're going to have. All right, let's go on to emergency response awareness. This is our second uh, type of setup for um, say, if you're working in IT security, sometimes the threats are not software wise. Sometimes they're physical problems, such as uh, the power has gone out. So in this case, the emergency response team has the power going out. The office is completely in the dark. Get your pens and pencils ready or your uh, notepad up on your computer. So what do we do? And in what order? The office is completely dark. And what do we not do? So get ready to write down your answers. And I apologize, the type is a little small here, but we had to get a lot on this slide here. So the first thing that you may or may not want to do, uh, these things may, in some cases may be in order, in other cases will not be in order. So number one, meet with the department heads to discuss the situation. Is this the first thing you do when the power goes out? You may not rethink it, but having the power go out is a big security issue. Uh, it's a big physical security issue. Uh, document incident and resolution. Is that the next thing you do? Probably not, but you know it's the next thing on the list. Create a group to stay on watch if the outage is estimated to be extended. You want to make sure that it's safe to do so. In some areas, when the power goes out, you don't want to be there. In other areas, it may be safe enough to, to leave a team on site. Uh, have the department heads tell the staff to leave all equipment plugged in until the power is restored. Number five, go to the server room to gracefully shut down all the servers before the battery life drains from your UPS. That's your uh, uninterruptible power supply to keep your servers up for a certain amount of time during an outage. Then you have call the power company to see if this is a, an area-wide outage. Have the department heads call their staff to unplug their computers and monitors and bring servers and equipment up when power is restored. 
All right, we only have a few minutes here, so I'm going to go ahead and go on to the next one. So hopefully you've written down uh, your answers. So here we go. Number one, go to the server room to gracefully shut down all servers and equipment before the UPS battery life drains. Why is this number one? Well, number one on the previous incident showed that you needed to go to the boss and the department heads to say, hey, we got a problem. But when the power goes out, you don't have to do that. They already know the power's out right there. You don't want to trip over yourself trying to get to the bosses to say, Hey, guess what? The power's out. They already know it. <laughs> so it's a different number one response than it was to a malware outage or a malware uh, incident. Number two, you want to call uh, the power company to see if this is an area wide outage. Why is that number two, instead of meeting with the department heads? Well, because the first thing what the, the department heads and the bosses are going to ask is, Hey, When's the power coming back? <laughs> so you won't be able to tell them until you call the power company and ask them uh, when the power is going to be back. So that's why that's number three. Number four, have the department heads tell their staff to unplug their computers and monitors. Well, the staff are all pretty much standing around, sitting around going, what do we do? We don't, we don't know if we're supposed to leave. We don't know how long this outage is going to be. So if it looks like it's going to be out for a bit, then you don't want to leave your computers and monitors plugged in because when that power turns on, it it has a rush of electricity that could fry a lot of components. I've seen this happen many times. So you want to make sure that the computers, the monitors, anything that may be sensitive electronic equipment is off. Then you want to create a group to stay on watch if it's safe uh, to uh, and then let everybody know when the power's back on. Power comes back on, bring that server and bring all the servers and equipment back up again, turn them all back on, document the incident resolution. Something you should not do is not have the department heads tell their staff to leave their equipment plugged in until the power is restored. So uh, hopefully you learn something there, learn something new about what to do in case your power goes out. Now you've learned all about the various different security certifications offered by CompTIA and through courses through Ascend Education. Here is my contact information, and now I'd love to take some questions from all of you. So, Victor, take it away. Well, thank you very much for your brilliant presentation. Um, I actually have some questions here from the audience. Uh, então, eu tenho algumas perguntas aqui da... da do pessoal, uh, tem a pergunta da Megan Adamson aqui, ela pergunta, eu vou fazer a pergunta uh, em português e em inglês, I'm gonna say the question in Portuguese and in English, so in Portuguese first, quais são as, um, quais são as tendências emergentes ou os desafios no, no campo da cibersegurança que estão atualmente sendo monitoradas pelo Robert uh, ou que ele está tratando delas na, na função atual dele. So, Robert, the question is, uh, what are some emerging trends or challenges in the cybersecurity landscape that you are currently monitoring or addressing in your role? Yes, there are there are constant changes uh, to security uh, issues that are happening. Uh, I remember in my you know the early days of uh, you know my career, those types of security issues were completely different than they are now. So for instance, the, the big issue early on in my career were, you know, viruses. It wasn't remote connectivity, remoting into other places and then deleting all their data. These are the kinds of challenges that we're having nowadays is that vulnerabilities in remote access software. It could be using a virtual private network or VPN. It could be using remote desktop. It could be using any one of the many different remote connectivity tools. What I'm finding is that more and more vulnerabilities are being found in these remote tools. And uh, so hackers are exploiting these vulnerabilities and using them to access computers that allow connectivity to them from the outside. So that is one of the, the big ones right there. The other one is and will continue to be for many years, phishing attacks. Phishing mm -hmm. attacks or phishing attempts by sending you emails to try to get you to click on a link to open up a fake website where you, where you will enter your real credentials, say to your bank account or to some other place, and then you could have your money or other resources stolen. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, another question from the audience here is actually from Marco, our student. 
he has a question concerning the job titles. If you could, for a second, sir, uh, go back to the to the slide where you have the the job roles, the the job titles. You know what I'd like to do instead of that is I'm going to give you something even better. Um, I want to show you a web page. Oh, pay all right. Sc yeah, payscale.com. And okay, it's can, pay yeah, can, can I just get it across? Sure, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, então, uh, eu ia, na verdade, perguntar para o Robert sobre as posições, sobre os, uh, as funções no ramo de, de cibersegurança e qual delas teria o maior salário e qual seria talvez um caminho, que é a sugestão do nosso aluno Marco. Uh, mas ele, então, agora está apresentando para a gente um website onde você mesmo pode fazer essa pesquisa caso você tenha dúvida em relação a qualquer uma das posições. Sir, it's with you. All right. Oh, let's see. Let me go back here. Security. So you can type in security in this website, and it shows you a list of all the different security types of positions uh, and what their average pay is. So here's a list right here, cybersecurity analyst, which is one of the first things that I had mentioned. Cybersecurity engineer, security analyst, security engineer, all these, these different things. And I filtered down to just specific security. But if you are looking for other positions within information technology, you can just you know go ahead and uh, leave that filter out. And you can see, look at this, 143 different positions. Wow. Uh, 143. When I got started in this business, there was one. <laughs> IT guy. <laughs> yeah. Now, now we have pages and, you know, pages of various different types of jobs and what their average salary and salary range is. Uh, so uh, very exciting. You can click on each one of these and it will give you a description of each type of position. Amazing. That, that, that's amazing. Uh, and actually, Marco is asking for the link. Uh, what is this website that we are seeing now? Yes. Uh, let me go back to number one here. And uh, let's see. Unfortunately, <laughs> there we go. Uh, let's show, it's showing me basically uh, you, you should create a, uh, an account, I guess. But uh, let me put that in. So let's see here. How am I going to get that into the chat for you? Okay. How do you want me to get that into the chat? Well, if you uh, actually, if you have like a notepad or something that you can write on. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I can get it to uh, our chat here. Okay. So what Thanks. I did was I went to what you see here. It's payscale.com right mm -hmm. here. And okay. then you can go to the search box and you can just type in information technology. You don't have to have this really long you know, URL that you see here. Just go to payscale.com and type in in the search box information technology, and you'll see the list of all those different jobs that I just showed you. Now, you may end up, if you click enough times, you may end up what happened, which what happened to me was the prompt to log in. It's a free uh, uh, account to sign in. So go ahead and, and create an account, and then you'll be able to click as many times as you want. But you have a limited amount of clicks, um, and obviously I exceeded that <laughs> uh, the first time you go in. Thank you, sir. See you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day.